Explicity Cast from Explicity. Shakespeare and Company sits on the very edge of the left bank. The store is close enough to the Seine that when one is standing in the front doorway, a well thrown apple core will easily reach the river water. From the same doorway, there's an inspired view of Ile de la Cité, and one can contemplate the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the Hotel Dieu Hospital, and the imposing block of the main police prefecture. The bookstore's actual address is 37 Rue de la Boucherie. It's an odd cobbled street that begins at Rue Saint-Jacques, runs one block, hits the public park of saint julien le pauvre then continues on for another two blocks before ending at the square Restif de la Bretonne. The bookstore is on the part of the Rue de la Boucherie, close to Rue Saint-Jacques, where, thanks to a quirk of city planning, there are only buildings on the south side of the street, which is what gives the bookstore its splendid view. The end of the street is reserved for pedestrians, but this is only part of the reason it retains a certain calm. There is also a tiny city garden that separates the bookstore from the racing traffic of the Quai Montebello. And then the sidewalk widens in front of 37 Rue de la Boucherie, to create an almost private esplanade for Shakespeare and Company. For the coup de grace, there are two young cherry trees on this esplanade and a green Wallace drinking fountain sitting majestically to the side. All this gives the bookstore an air of tranquility that is shocking in the midst of the frenzy and noise of downtown Paris. As for the bookstore itself, there are actually two entrances. Facing the shop, The main part of the store, with the narrow green door I entered on the day of the tea party, is on the right. It is here that one finds the famous yellow and green wooden Shakespeare and Company sign and the broad picture window. To the left of the main store, there is a second, smaller storefront. This is the antiquarian room. Along with the shelves of centuries-old books, the antiquarian room had a desk, a lovely stuffed armchair, and of course, a creaky but thoroughly sleepable bed. The door creaked to announce me, but George kept gazing out the window deep in private thought. The store is irregular light. I could see his uneven tussle of fine white hair and the thin wrinkles that lined his face. After long moments, he shook his head as if awakening from a dream and turned to look at me. His eyes were an impossibly pale blue. What do you want? he demanded. His voice was so gruff that I took a step backward. Stammering, my first lines disappeared but something about being a writer with no place else to go. I I wouldn't stay for long, I finished. Uh, Just enough time to catch my feet. I've hit a bit of a rough patch. He stood there, praising me with his pale eyes, stopping time. You've written books? I nodded. Are they self-published? Using a vanity press is akin to buying sex, but more shameful in a way. Visiting a prostitute is at least a very private act while paying to publish one's book is a very public display of creative desperation. Despite my nervousness, I took a front to the question. Though the crime books I'd written were hardly works of great literature, I was proud of what I'd accomplished. No, no, not at all, I replied, trying to keep the anger from my voice. I'm not saying they're the best books ever written, but I had a real publisher. George waved the back of his hand at me as if I was speaking nonsense, but a smile crept across his face. Ha! A real writer wouldn't have asked. He would have just come in and taken a bed. You, you can stay, but you'll sleep downstairs with the rest of the riffraff. And like that, things changed forever. When George Whitman, in 1951, established a bookstore... He wanted it to be more than a literary sanctuary for book lovers. He turned it into a sanctuary for writers seeking inspiration. The bookshop, as any devotee of books or really any of my listeners would have guessed, is the legendary Shakespeare and Company in the heart of Paris. Whitman welcomed all writers who needed a place to stay as his own personal guest at the bookstore, and to accommodate them, He had rooms and beds and made space available entirely free. This philosophy is best summarized by a sign painted above one of the doors inside that reads, Be kind to strangers, lest they be angels in disguise. In exchange for staying there for free, these indigent writers, Whitman called them tumbleweeds, 
were asked only to read a book a day and help stack books and carry out other chores in the shop. Oh, and they had to write something autobiographical about themselves for Whitman's archives. Today, Shakespeare and Company is said to have played host and refuge to an estimated 40,000 tumbleweeds since 1951. One such tumbleweed that blew through Shakespeare and Company was my guest today, Jeremy Mercer, author of a delightful book, Books, Begets, and Bedbugs. The book has another, and uh, in my opinion, better title, Time Was Soft There. Towards the end of 1999, Jeremy had to abandon his life in Canada as a crime reporter because he received death threats. You'll find out why in this podcast. And he decided to scrape some money together and fly to Paris. Jeremy soon was broke and without a place to stay ended up living in Shakespeare and Company as another tumbleweed. During his time, Jeremy writes about how he met a vibrant cast of characters that included George Whitman and his fellow tumbleweeds. Jeremy's daily life became inseparable from the bookstore's activities and its rich history and its literary heritage. Again, most of my listeners would already know that Shakespeare and Company, which was first started by Sylvia Beach, was frequented by Ernest Hemingway, Scott Fitzgerald, James Joyce, and other people we have come to know as literary giants. In fact, Sylvia Beach first published James Joyce's Ulysses when no one else would. In Whitman's time, Shakespeare and Company served as a base for many of the writers of the Beat generation, including Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, and William Burroughs. Books, baguettes, and bedbugs gives us a sense of the bohemian world of artists and writers in Paris, as it celebrates the charm of independent bookstores. But above all, Jeremy brings us close to George Whitman, the legend. And now he joins me from his home in beautiful Provence in France. Jeremy Mercer, welcome to the Literary City. It's a real pleasure for me to be here today with you. I look forward to our conversation. My pleasure entirely. Now, you have been a journalist and an author. Materially, what's the difference? Well, I think the first thing about uh, journalism is, is, is there's a real time pressure. I mean, daily journalism, when you work for a newspaper, you're having to fill the paper every day. Right. So your primary goal is to write interesting words, but to make sure the facts are correct, that it's readable, and that you meet your deadline. And that's not always conducive to great writing. And another thing about newspaper writing is that it, it has to be fairly straightforward. I mean, we're no longer in the days of where everything has to be the inverted pyramid, pyramid where you go, you know, first most important fact, second most important fact. But you don't have the same time to develop characters or even worse, go into nuance, right? I mean, newspapers are very black and white. Hmm. I, I think that's one of the reasons why Newspapers are fantastic as a first draft of history, but that you do need to step back and think and reflect and have readers and writers who can take time to uh, present arguments over you know, long-form works of 10, 20, 30,000 words. So that would be the difference I'd make. And the other difference I'd make is that as a journalist, uh, it, it's sort of like you're sprinting and you're doing really well in this really quick environment. And so it doesn't challenge you to think more. And you sort of think, hey, look at me. I can write a thousand word article. My editor's happy. I'm a great writer. Right. And it's only when you step back from that world and take time to read the great works of uh, global literature that you start to go, oh, actually, I'm just a hack. You know, <laughs> I can string a couple of words together and uh, that's about it. But gun to your head, what would you rather be? A writer or author? I would rather be a, a, a nonfiction author working on longer ideas pieces. Mm -hmm. um, that said, at the moment, I'm sort of overwhelmed by how much content there is in the world. And I guess I'm sort of amazed at the younger version of myself who was so confident that his words had to be read. And uh, now I'm very, very hesitant before I put ideas out there. Um, I was once on book tour with a very famous crime writer. And uh, they said, 
Jeremy, I'm going to give you some advice. When you get out there, you make sure the audience knows if they're going to read one book this year, it's yours. I was like, really? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe Dostoevsky? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) And and so I guess that that feeling has come to haunt me is, is time is so valuable. And there's so much great literature. Uh, what am I adding to the global discourse when I write? So by that argument, is it the corollary that literary writing is licensed to float free of rules? Mm-mm-mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Free of rules, uh, which is beautiful. I mean, now we're talking about fiction, of course. And uh, fiction is glorious for that because it, it, it can break rules and you aren't, don't have that anchor of fact, right? Keeping the ship of, of the book moored. So it can take you to interesting places. And, and some, of, some of my favorite books these days are ones that are able to do sort of like metaphysical, metaphysical work. While also illuminating, right? I, 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 I'm a bit Cartesian in the sense that I still really like to learn when I read. Mm-hmm. So emotion is good. I don't know, are, are you a fan of music? No, I'm a jazz guitarist. So you are a much more cultivated, cultured man than I am? <laughs> well, good someone calls jazz cultured. Absolutely, because you, you, you're, you're registering on a different level. You have an emotional response to sounds. I listen to music and I'm thinking, mm, I should be probably listening to a podcast. Yes. I could be learning something. You know, so I'm... I'm I'm a dull guy. My my daughter constantly reproaches me. I wish I'd been born into a musical family and not a podcast family. Well, tell her to thank her stars that she wasn't. <laughs> the horror. <laughs> so back to your writing. Now, reportage, whether it's news or features, gives you a certain discipline. And I find that in your writing, I find a certain linearity of prose in your writing. So did you fight that or did you embrace it? Oh, I, I absolutely embrace it. And I, I think that like writing should be a clear window, if you will, that to show onto your ideas so that you see onto the ideas of the writer. And I think words should be precise and original. You know, we get, you, you know, beyond the, the cliches of language, there's also, you know, words that become so overused that they no longer speak to the reader. So I am dedicated to making writing as clear as possible. And we also live in a society that's plagued with communication, where people are always selling with their words, selling with their words. So uh, thank you for recognizing that. And I do a lot of translation now, too, with French writers. Oh, my God. As a general rule, and this is a stereotype, but uh, French writers, they all always take 60 words to say what could be said in 10. (laughs) <laughs> and it uh, it drives me crazy. <laughs> well, you did quote George Whitman in your book, saying, you have to use words like cannonballs if you want to move people. Isn't that brilliant advice for writers? It truly is. Now, this transition that you made from being a journalist to a writer uh, until you blew it and, yeah. and had to run away. Absolutely, yeah. So this transition, was it difficult I think it was, I was chasing a dream. I was young and I had that relentless desire to do something. And you're not afraid of risk. And it's this moment of freedom. Luckily, I didn't have to think about the transition. I just did. Because I think you're right. If I'd thought about it, I would have probably just frozen and gone back. I mean, many of my older colleagues, they were astounded I'd leave a steady job. You know, they were astounded. And it turned out to be the best thing I ever did, obviously. You know, speaking of transitions, you were first published in, what, 1997. How has the publishing world changed since then? Well, that's a fantastic question. I mean, 1997 was before the whole online digital publishing. It was on the the context of promoting, right? I mean, I don't know if you know about book talk and things like that. The whole the way... We used to say, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. Mm-hmm. And today we could say, don't judge a book by its TikTok review, you know? <laughs> so I, I think the marketing around it has changed. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that's interesting is the amount of reading has changed. Like people begrudge the internet because, you know, it's taking people away from books, but people are reading more than ever, oh, yeah. right? Or even if it's on their phones. So that's changed in the sense that there's more words and content consumed. And the other thing that's changed from my point of view is uh, the attention span. Oh, boy. 
uh, I find fewer and fewer people willing to, you know, 350 pages is now a very long book. Right. Um, but that said, I, I'm still very fond of publishing as a business. I work with many publishers and, and I think it's a viable business. And I think the printed book, just like the LP, as if you're a jazz fan, mm -hmm. is always going to be around because people have a physical connection with, with the literature. Right, right. I was surprised that printed books survived when magazines and newspapers didn't. Mm -hmm. And Bangalore, where I live, is actually known for its independent bookstores. Interesting. And by the way, I found your book in one such independent bookstore. It's called Gobe, G-O-O-B-E, means owl. And it's located in a basement, and the owner opens the store when he wants to. <laughs> it's a lovely little place. Yeah. And you know how bookstore owners mm -hmm. have this uncanny way of figuring you out and knowing what books you like. Absolutely. And he takes one look at me, walks right up and hands me books, baguettes and bed bugs, and says, this is what you're buying. That's amazing. What's the name of the book, sir? Goopy? G? G-O-O-B, like in Bravo, E. Nice. Okay, I'm going to Google that as soon as I'm fascinated by this. And there's uh, another coincidence. The podcast that was released on the day of my visiting the bookstore was featuring another tumbleweed. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. You know, a famous Indian writer called Jeet Thayil. He's a pal, lives in okay. Bangalore, too. And on the show, he mentioned being a tumbleweed and staying in uh, in Shakespeare and Company. Right, he stayed there. What? When did he stay? Yeah, this before, was in the 90s, before, okay. yeah, before yeah. you. And he talks about how mm -hmm. he was broke. He was living in Gare du Nord and uh, then went to Shakespeare and Company and lived there with Whitman. And the other. It's an amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. I buy the book and I go home and I read it and I call my colleague, P with an A, and I say, hey, I love this book. Let's get Jeremy Mercer on the show. <laughs> and here you are. Uh, fantastic. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's, so a, it's a great moment. Yeah. So uh, back to business. Now, you don't think mm -hmm. very highly of self-publishing, do you? You don't respect that. But off the air, before we started, right. you told me that the business itself of self-publishing was predatory, well, I, I find there's, there's a couple of things I have my problem with it. First, I find it very, very exploitive. I, I've worked with a lot of young writers and they dream, they have such a passion for writing. And there's these people who ask for thousands and thousands of dollars to help edit and publish the book. And I find that, I, I, find, I find, as you say, predatory. I also think that the publishing world is so rich and even like in America, there's 17 big publishers or 15 now. Who cares about them? Beyond that, there's thousands of great university presses, small local presses. So that means there's more than thousands and thousands of editors buying and reading books. And I think you should work to the point where one of those editors is willing to, to buy your book. Even if it's for $100, it means a professional is willing to buy it and work with you and get your book to market. And if you don't do that, you're sort of skipping a step in the process. I have had this discussion with a few people who have had their books self-published. Mm -hmm. And when I ask them, don't you think you have to pay your dues? They say, nah, you know, the publishing guys, they're all gatekeepers. And anyway, this is easier. It, it is easy. Well, see, that's the other thing. It's kind of like dismissing all media as, as, you know, as big media. Gatekeepers, yeah, but look at the diversity of presses from African-American presses to uh, LGBTQI presses to you know, indigenous presses to art presses, photography pre There, If these are the gatekeepers, I'm all for it because these editors are so diverse. Um, and it is, the, the word you used is perfect. It's easier uh, I was just consulting on a project and, and the client said, no, we want to publish it because that way no one has to tell us what to do. Hmm. I'm like, well, what if they have good advice? Right. We know what we're doing. Really? I said, hmm. I, I mean, you're a writer, you know, the, the most beautiful things come out of collaboration, Truly. back and forth, listening to someone. I mean, uh, having a good editor, a thoughtful, insightful, caring editor is a gift for a writer. And I think, these people come from publishers and not hucksters trying to make a few bucks off you. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you completely on that. Mm. So anyway, it was following Money for Nothing that you uh, had death threats. 
Yeah. And, and you yeah. needed to flee Ottawa, was it? Is that where you oh, lived? It's such, yeah, it was such a hilarious, looking back, it was a very funny story. I was, I was going behind the scenes of crimes mm -hmm. and interviewing criminals about how they commit uh, you, crimes. You were a crime reporter, principally. Was, yeah. Precisely. I'd spent seven years working as a crime reporter for a Canadian newspaper and had written a crime book and had a very good uh, network of, of criminal contacts. And they all agreed to talk to me off the record where I had to sort of mask their identity, give them new names. And I did that. But then the idiot that I am, I thanked one of them in the preface using his <laughs> real name. You did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was a young guy in his 20s. And little did I know, that was bad enough, but he'd just been accepted into the Hells Angels uh, oh, distribution network, oh no. which is which is like a big step. You know what I mean? So, and when he got accepted in, they said, stop talking to the journalists. I know you like to talk, to no more, right? So he promised he got into Hells Angels. And then like uh, six months later, I thank him in a book. So yeah, they smashed open my apartment and threatened me. Yeah, so it was pretty. It was pretty terrifying, but it was such a happy ending for everyone because he was not accepted. He was kicked out. He had to leave town too, so he moved from Ottawa to Toronto. Uh, he became a, a salesperson in a tech store, so he was he became the leading salesman because he was so good at pressuring people to buy extended warranties. And meanwhile, all the guys who went into the Hell's Angels at the same time of him all ended up doing five, ten, fifteen years of prison. So about five years later, he called me up to thank me. But the four years in between were very, very stressful. Oh, my God. No, it is. Yeah. It, you, you, it's not nice to be on the receiving end of death. Threats. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's, no. It's dreadful. And yeah. you moved to, you, you took a flight and went to Paris. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I went to Paris. I, uh, the day I threw up my return ticket was uh, a big day. Mm-hmm. And uh, a few days later, I found, thank God, touch wood, I found the Shakespeare and Company bookstore, which gave me that cushion. I let my uh, return ticket go. I ripped it up as a statement. And then I just looked, started walking and looking, and I found the bookstore. And, and that's what gave me a, a new start, because it gave me that moment to breathe, to make plans. But most importantly, it put me into a community of people who were wandering who were searching for things, who weren't part of the system. So suddenly, like, it didn't feel that risky or that outrageous what I was doing. Uh, and those friends have become some of the dearest friends of, in my life, the people I met during that period. And you wrote books, baguettes, and bedbugs in 2005, wasn't it? You might say that I'm a little late to the party. You are a little late to the party. Uh, first of all, it was published as Time Was Soft There in America. Right. Yes, I know. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, prefer the title Time Was Soft There. Uh, why did they change it in the British edition? They felt it was more catchy, yeah. Well, on the Shakespeare and Company's website, it's still sold as books, baguettes, and bedbugs. Are they selling the book now? That's it. That's amazing. That's, they, they, they didn't sell it for a long, long time. Oh, it's a crazy story. But um, George, the owner of the bookstore, he was in his 60s, and he, he seduced a woman in her 20s. Yeah, that, that, that bit's in the book. So did your mentioning that upset the family, that the daughter who uh, took over the business? Uh, when I wrote the book, I let the daughter read it to make sure, you know, nothing's too sensitive for her. She said, it's fantastic. Go ahead and publish. And? The book was published, and when mom read the book, she went ballistic. Oh. Because she has now become a very conservative religious woman. Ah. So this chapter of the, she always tried to hide this chapter of her life when she was like a hippie having uh, an intimate relationship with a man 40 years her senior. So she was unhappy about it, and she asked her daughter if she knew anything about the book, and the daughter was so upset, she She said, no, 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 no. I didn't know anything about it. Uh, and so the daughter couldn't have it at the bookstore for a few years because the mom was upset about it. But I guess that means she's mellowed, which is a, a good sign. Well, it's right there. Okay, to move yeah. on. A uh, number of people who have written about Shakespeare and company have always tried to describe the <laughs> so, bohemian uh, nature of uh, George Whitman and what he achieved. 
you lived it. So the question I have is this bohemian life devoid of creature comfort. Mm -hmm. It's is yeah. it great when you're living in the middle of it? Being bohemian is superb. We're in the, in the middle of it all. As long as it stops at some point from my point of view. I was I was 6 months at the bookstore and then apartment hopping and then I was involved in the squat scene in Paris for 2 years. Mm -hmm. So it was a 3-year period of my life and it shaped me. It it was amazing and it's really made me grateful today because you speak of creature comforts and I see so many unhappy people. I'm like, guys, there's water out of the taps, you know, there's food. We should be delighted. So it was really, really good in that sense. It makes you appreciate the fundamentals of life. But I don't think you want to do it for years. You may recall I wrote about a, a poet who'd lived in the bookstore for many, many, many years. Yeah, I do. And he was... Uh, he was severely harmed by living so poorly for so long. Hmm. Well, here's something of interest to my Indian listeners who make up about half my listeners. Okay. Uh, you wrote this book, Books, Baguettes, and Bedbugs, in Udaipur. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It was sensational. How did that was, happen? Uh, How did that come to be? Well, I was traveling. I needed. I wanted to get away to write. And it was during a period of uh, intense uh, tension between Pakistan and India. Yes. So there was a, a travel advisory. So in Indian tour spots were relatively empty. Okay. So I was able to stay in this little hotel in Udaipur, uh, Uda, Udaipur with uh, no one else around. Nice. And I ended up staying for a month, and I was writing thousands of words a day, and it was uh, a magical experience, one of the greatest experiences of my life, yeah. Now, speaking of life experience... The, the hero of your book, if there's a hero in the yeah. book, is uh, George Whitman. Did you see him as a mentor? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I probably, I mean, for a while, perhaps I overlooked some of his shortcomings in the sense that he had such a profound influence on my life. He was so generous. And speaking of bohemian, I mean, the thing to remember is that I lived in that space for six months, but he was living in this turmoil, this creative, he had his own apartment, but he was always surrounded by people and noise and creative, uh, creative energy. And it must've been incredibly taxing, but he did this and he maintained it for 50 years. And it's, uh, it's just such an amazing thing he did for so many people. You speak of tumbleweeds, but people who passed through his store were touched for life and carried with him his sort of spirit of generosity and sharing for life. And it's, uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing he did. So uh, I, I still admire him greatly. Today he passed away, sadly, uh, to a hero. And he was seen as a hero by many people. That's touching. And George Whitman was the uh, was the utopian essence of socialism. Absolutely, and, and that's what he tried to make happen in the store. Absolutely, he tried to make that happen, and he was so much bigger than me. I'm not a big enough person to suffer so much, or to be so tolerant, or to uh, accept people's foibles, or. But he was just willing to do it, and uh, it's it's an amazing. It, it really is. Even if I just have ten percent of his generosity. Uh, that's a fantastic thing. I, I hear you completely. So what's it like now? Is, it, is the Tumbleweed Hotel as charming as you remember it? No. Uh, so it's for better and for worse. Just so you know, in the later years of his life, Paris, the Paris city government turned a blind eye to many, many, many infractions at the, at the, at the store. And so when his daughter took over, they said, okay, now we have a responsible person and you need to get this done. So she really improved the shop. She made it safer. She tightened up the way people could sleep there. And she's a bit more um, discriminating when it came to who could sleep in the store. She limited the numbers. So that, so it became much cleaner. The cooking, the cockroaches, all those things gone. And the other thing she did is she put the books are back on financial footing and she opened up a little cafe bakery just beside it. Again, a brilliant idea because grace of thanks to this, the bookstore is continuing. You know, let's talk about you. You acted in a movie with uh, Jean Reno, was it? Yes, I did. I it's was, called um, Avi de Mischal or... Uh... Absolutely. I was uh, in Marseille. Marseille is yeah. a big film center. It's kind of like ah. the, the Mambay. 
right. of, uh, of France. Sure. Uh, Paris is the big capital, but we have a lot of 400 films a year made down here. So for a while, I was had bit roles mm-hmm. in movies. Anytime they needed a, a strange-looking foreigner, my phone would ring. And I was lucky enough to play a part in a very successful film with Jean Reno. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's called Avi de Mistral. Now, this is a yeah. coincidence that that is the name of George Whitman's bookstore when he opened it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Can I tell you something? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't make that connection until you just mentioned it. And wow, that's, uh, that's uh, pretty stunning. I, I may have to sit there. Whew. Yeah, absolutely. George's first bookstore was Avi de Le Mistral. Was Le Mistral. And before he borrowed the name Shakespeare and Company from uh, from from the old story, yeah. Good observation. You should uh, you should uh, be a therapist. I think that's uh, <laughs> my, brilliant. My girlfriend wouldn't agree with you. <laughs> so, from all that time living in the bohemian squalor of Shakespeare and Company, to where you are now in beautiful Provence, and look at that view outside your window. It's fantastic. So, I take it. You don't miss rank toilets? I do not miss rank toilets. And I'm so spoiled to be writing from home that I don't even like it when I occasionally have to go to an office someplace to meet with people because I'm away from my beloved toilet. Uh, <laughs> if this was a video tour, I'd take you to my toilet with a beautiful view of the Luberon Hills. But yes, even what I can see uh, of the Luberon uh, Hills from, uh, from here is pretty fantastic. Okay, so... What's next? So I'm going to not tell you too much about it because we're very excited, but it's a children's book uh, involving a, 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 a girl who speaks many different languages and solves international crises thanks to her language abilities. And the idea is, is that each book will be able to share a vocabulary of 150 to 200 words in a second language with the reader. So Fantastic. it's, uh, yeah, I'm not going to give you the base idea because that would be like telling you about a wizard who goes away to, uh, you know, a castle, but <laughs> we're very excited. Very excited. L- let me know when that happens. We can have you back on the show. I would love to. I'll let you know for sure. That would be a true honor to talk to you again. Yeah. Well, Jeremy Mercer, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Thanks so much. You just heard Jeremy Mercer, author of books Baguettes and Bedbugs. Uh, My American listeners would know it as Time Was Soft There. There's a link in the podcast description to where you can buy that book. And now it's time for our very popular segment, What's That Word?, where we discuss the origins of words and phrases. today's What's That Word is going to be more about Paris. And to help me with it, here she is, my co-host. Hello, my name is Pranati, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. And hello, P with an A. You're looking all chipper this morning. What's not to like? I mean, this short break that we were on felt like forever. So I'm just (laughs) so happy to be back. Just when I thought I had shaken you off. (laughs) You'll need wild horses to drag me out of this studio. I knew there was a way. (laughs) Hey, I totally loved the interview with Jeremy Mercer. Thank you. You know, I remember that you said you once totally lost yourself inside Shakespeare and Company. I get lost in every bookstore. I mean, I just can't (laughs) seem to find my way out of any. But... (laughs) Yes, Shakespeare and Company was special. It felt like magic. Yeah, it does. Uh, You know, Hemingway, he devoted a a chapter, uh, an essay to it in uh, A Movable Feast. Yeah, I read it a few years ago. And more magic there. But Mm. remind me, what did he say about Sylvia Beach? In Movable Feast? Um, That she had pretty legs? (laughs) No. Really? That's what he Mm. said? Well, it was the 20s. I'm, I'm not so sure that uh, he was being disrespectful. Of course not. Merely expressing his innermost thoughts. <laughs> yes. Which were about Sylvia Beach's legs. Well, it was a different time. And you know what they say. What happens on the left Stays bank... Stays in a Hemingway bestseller for posterity. <laughs> Very good. 
<laughs> I'm kidding. I'm such a huge Hemingway fan. I mean, I know all the criticisms about his misogyny and so on, but I'm not about to pull down his statue. Oh, nice of you. <laughs> hey. Okay, P with an A. What's that word? I gather you want to talk about the left bank, Rive Gauche. So my question is this. Uh, the left bank is known for being liberal and the right bank is more buttoned up and all business, isn't it? Mm -hmm, correct. So is there a parallel with the left wing and right wing politics or is left mm. and right bank merely geographical references? Nice. You know, I did go hunting for this some years ago, but uh, I got no answers. But hey, nice allusion. Thank you. But I would have thought that the association would have been more commonly assumed. Well, I don't know about commonly assumed. But as I said, I have found scanty mentions of this thought. Anyway, what would you like to know? Uh, I'm assuming that you would like me to make a foursome of right bank, left bank, and the left side of things, and right <laughs> side of things. <laughs> yes. The etymology, please. Cool. So, I'll start with the origins of left wing and right wing. So during the French Revolution in 1789, the National Assembly gathered to, uh, to write the new constitution, right? And those in favor of the monarchy sat on the right side of the president and all the revolutionaries sat on the left. So this seating arrangement reflected the political discussions of that time. Ah, interesting. Yes, isn't it? So the right wing represented conservative and traditional values. They wanted to maintain the status quo, you know, the social and political order, mm -hmm. ergo the uh, monarchy. And the left wing stood for progressive, liberal politics. They wanted change, equality, uh, social reform, you know. You mean like laws against staring and commenting on the legs of the most famous bookseller in Paris. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Well, that bill clearly did not pass. <laughs> but please, go on. That's pretty much it about left and right wing. Uh, well, the left wing group included what was known as the bourgeoisie, the urban workers and intellectuals who believed in democracy and social justice. And ever since then, Left wing and right wing have been used to categorize people into those respective political ideologies. Uh -huh. From 1789, and we still can't find mm. middle ground. The centrist movement started with that guy walking on a rope, carrying a long stick to keep from falling off. <laughs> He's still doing his thing. And do left bank and right bank have anything to do with political affiliation? I guess that... Uh... Wait, first, how did they decide which bank is which? Oh, okay. So when you face downstream, that's the direction in which the water flows. On your left is the left bank. I get it. And how did the left bank become left wing? In Paris, the left bank's bohemian character, demeanor, could have happened also because of the presence of the universities, uh, you know, artistic communities on the on the southern banks of the Seine, and um, the Rive Droite, on the other hand, was more conservative. Fantastic! And in what direction does the river Seine flow? Uh, northwards. So the west is. Hey, hey, one sec. You know what just occurred to me? What in? New York City in Manhattan, if you face north, on the left is the west side, and it's just like the left bank in Paris. And the west side and the east side of the city of Manhattan have the same bohemian versus button-down feel about them. <laughs> That's so wonderful. And do any other cities have that? Yes, here at home in Bangalore, inside Koshi's Cafe. <laughs> Are you talking about our beloved refuge that was established in 1939? Yes, where we meet every day, you know. <laughs> oh, that one. Well, yes. I remember you wrote in an article about the two sides of Koshi's. Uh, may I? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Koshi's Cafe is like the stereotype noisy cafe where people loudly discuss mm -hmm. literature and politics. And on the other mm -hmm. side, 
on the right is the mm-hmm. fancy air conditioned restaurant where the dull people go <laughs> dull people i didn't say dull people i did i mean you wrote when you walk into the door at koshi's the left is turn left i did oh i'm chuffed that you remembered all that i do you know when you asked jeremy about being bohemian i felt a pang you know i felt i was mm. born in a generation too late to have enjoyed it i missed it huh. and when i read about the bohemian life i dream about defining life intellectually not the way it is <laughs> well you can make your choices about how you live it's no fun without hemingway and allen ginsberg <laughs> i guess you'll have to make do with beard al yankovic <laughs> that's a good idea actually he did say girls just want to have lunch and that sir <laughs> is where i'm headed bye and that is our show i'd like to thank my guest jeremy massa and my co-host pranati p with an a mother and all of you for being here for listening for subscribing for writing in and leaving those wonderful comments and for those of you who haven't please hit that subscribe button and the like button and leave your comments on whichever platform you listen to podcasts apparently it'll go a long way in helping us and that's all she wrote see you soon